Betty Julian. Uh, the girl sat with, can't remember her name. Oh, Edna. 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 I've got the answers um, here. Somebody guilty, is it? Stenson. Now, Daniel Stenson. And uh, Gilsey, is that? Yeah, Mary. Gilsey. Mary. Uh, don't know that chap. Uh, I know that Margaret Stilling. She's a boat, isn't she? That's another boat, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Norma. So, two girl bones, Margaret Stilling, the girl Suckley, Betty <coughs> Julian, Arlene Ford, and uh, Arlene Wall, is it? Anyway, if you didn't do too bad. There's the man now. Right, before we get started, it's not the uh, big crowd again. It's um, been some time since we did the last talk. That's right, right back in uh, November when we cut the first part of the 1940s. And then we actually got up to about sort of August of 1940. So this is like a continuation of that talk, and we've just added loads more to bring up to the uh, thing in the 1950s. Uh, just a few safety things. Uh, the fire exit is is just there, but just in case that's on fire, the other fire exit is through the uh, vestry and out the back. And we actually gather on the lawn out the front so we can count the numbers up and make sure we haven't lost anybody. Um, the toilets, as you know, are just out. The, in the vestry on the left, and we'll have refreshments at half time. Um, it's a bit of a treat tonight because instead of just one of us doing it, or two of us <coughs> as it was last time, it's actually going to be all three of us presenting it because we've all done di had different bits. Um, so I'll be across this side, Jim and Morris will be over that side, and please feel free to sort of chip in if you've got any other stories, any comments to make about some of the photos we're going to show you. So we'll have a break probably after about half an hour. And then we'll get on to the second half after the important bit of the evening, which obviously is the raffle. Um, yeah, the photo we got up there, it's actually in the Bed's Times about a year ago, on their, sort of, um, their memories page. And basically it was a group of youngsters that decided they were going to get together and put on a concert. And the concert was actually at the West End Club, the old West End Club, when it was a tin hut. And um, they were raising money to go towards prisoners of war. I assume English prisoners of war rather than uh, any of the Italians or Germans, we can talk about later. Um, and apparently, um, the whole show was disrupted by um, air raid sirens going off, mm -hmm. and like, yeah, obviously, they couldn't really perform in the dark, but they still raised loads of money, so it's good to sort of see that. And like I say, this thing seems to be playing up a bit, so I'm going to, have to keep leaning over. <coughs> Right, so basically, actually, do you two up come mm. yeah, down the front there? Yeah. They're going to be interrupting and chipping in as I go along. <coughs> so if I start talking nonsense, then feel free to, to dive in. Yeah? Right, this is something my brother found on the internet. It's amazing things you can find on the internet. These are um, maps that were issued to the Luftwaffe <coughs> to help them identify sort of various targets. And they did these for all the major cities and towns in Britain, this is the one for Bedford. Um, I'm not sure how good people's German is, um, but there's four main targets that are listed at the bottom. So, the Grosser Schleifer der Ouse means the big bend in the river, the big loop in the river. Um, the Flugplatz Cardington mit Nachschublager is, obviously Cardington's the giveaway on that one, so it's obviously the airfield at Cardington and Nachschublager is um, the, de the storage depot. Um, <coughs> to see the Auski name, I'm not going to do the whole talk in German, by the way, just in case you're getting worried. Um, the Auski name to Geisen Lagens via Bahnhofer uh, means the extensive railway network and the two railway stations. And also the and, gas oh, and there's also, yeah, it says to the north of the, the gas, gas works and three gasometers. So that's another main target. And the last one, thank God, is uh, Mayor of uh, Tom Gruben Südwestli, which means um, several clay pits in the southwest. <laughs> right, now I'm back to English now. Right, and that's um, an aerial photograph that again they use to identify the various targets. So you say Queen's Park, middle of Queen's Park is marked as A. For some reason, they really like to bomb the loop in the river and to stop people paddling in it. I'm not, there's not, nothing actually there, but they thought there was something else 
they saw the pits and thought that might be sort of <coughs> another clay pit. Um, B is the um, Carnington air spit. Um, D is the clay pits that are obviously still there. And C is the railway stations. And obviously they haven't marked the gas on design, have they? Which is obviously going to be around about there. Oh, right. Well, of course, yeah. It's place, isn't it? yeah. Um, but Morris actually pointed out that one of those, that, that is actually the old railway station where it was at the bottom of um, the road. Yeah. But this one, C, I don't know if you want to say about well, that one. <coughs> well, I've got a feeling that their, um, their military intelligence was a little bit out of date. Um, the, uh, the two railway stations that are marked, is one is marked pretty accurately, this one here by Fordham Road Bridge. The other one is marked down here, um, near Antill Road. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, what I think has actually happened is that during the First World War, um, they used the sidings there to uh, do the troop movements and load troops, uh, troop trains up during the First World War. And their, their sort of military intelligence is probably about 30 years out of date. They were looking at things from, possibly from, uh, say, German prisoners of war for, during the First World War, who had spotted all this extensive um, um, sidings with platforms on, where the troops had been loaded in 1914, 15, 1916, but hadn't actually been used during the Second World War. The only, possibly, the... The reason why they're so interested in the loop in the river is that they tended to, to use moonlit nights and the, the uh, moon shining off the, the, the body of water would be quite a distinctive C-shape going round from, uh, from the Bedford Town Centre through Queen's Park, round Kempston to Bromham and up to Clapham. It would be quite a distinctive loop and it actually says the loop in the river so I think they're probably thinking that that would be a, a really distinctive thing that they could actually see from, from whatever height they're flying from, to be able to see it, rather than something that they're actually going to use as, something, as, as a target to aim for. The other thing was quite uh, distinctive about this, the one on Bedford, because I've seen other ones as well. Most, almost every single one, both the map <coughs> and the corresponding aerial photograph, almost all the other ones had loads of targets marked on it, factories, um, anywhere that they thought it was going to be disruptive to, uh, to, uh, to the war effort. And uh, Bedford hasn't got anything marked in it at all uh, along those lines. Uh, some, even some relatively small towns have actually got sort of areas that are sort of um, blanked in, saying that that is a place, it may, it may just say factory, but uh, it was actually somewhere that was actually a target, but there was no actual targets. Uh, Apart from uh, the railway stations and the um, and the gas works, which probably uh, explains why Bedford wasn't really targeted to any great extent during, during the Second World War. Right, well, I suppose it's interesting that obviously Alan's was doing a lot of it work. Could be, it, could, excuse me, it could be that they thought it was a holiday resort. The bottom says Bedford on the ooze. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I don't know what other bench that uh, wasn't on news that they would have expected. Uh, that was it, yeah. What I was saying, um, obviously, Adams is there, and Adams was doing a lot of work towards the, the war effort, even JP White's, you know, sort of making um, France's first Spitfires. But obviously, the intelligence, again, didn't reach that far either. <coughs> so, as they say on the telly, if you don't want to know the result, you need to look away now. Because the result of all that intelligence was the first bombs to land in Bedford. And number one on their target, the loop in the river, was where the bombs actually landed. So this was actually on the, um, the night of November the 14th in 1940. And I'll just read a little bit from this um, cutting from the Bed's Times. Uh, it says, a, Ger a lone German raider swooped out of a moonlit sky on the evening of 14th November and dropped two large at high explosives in and just outside the borders of a home county's town. So obviously, because of the um, sort of Secrets Act and so on, uh, they weren't allowed to actually say that this was in Bedford. Of course, anyone that lived anywhere near by when it happened had all the windows blown out or the roofs blown off and know exactly that <coughs> that's the bombs that were there the other night um, and caused quite a bit of disruption. Um, but because of um, 
you know, sort of maybe spies finding out extra information. They weren't allowed to say anything apart from it's a home county's town. The thing is a bit ironic that the first time bombs landed in Bedford, there's this huge advert down the side of the um, Living Court from the EP Roses. Um, and it's a little bit too late to protect your windows with spinderproof proof curtain net. Um, obviously they're getting quickly, you place your shattered windows with glass fabric. And there's various other companies that are saying, you know, we'll repair the damage. So obviously people are getting in quite quick and sort of offering to repair any damage. Um, so basically one bomb actually dropped in um, Cox's pits. And I thought I'd read a couple of um, quotes from people, some of them from a website and some from someone I met the other day. Um, First of all, John Benson, some people might know, there's a yeah. yeah. road. Yeah. He said, um, when it happened, the bombs, uh, his dad was on nights and he was upstairs getting ready for work when this blooming bang went. He ended up at the bottom of the stairs. Um, he also said it was a lovely clear night, so the fire watchers at Allen's had a really good view of these two parachutes coming down, because they actually came down on parachutes. And they went, um, they went running up the road with their guns, but then he did actually admit that they weren't real guns, they were actually imitation wooden guns. <laughs> so I'm not sure what use they were going to be, you know, if they did actually find any Germans. Um, and then somebody else, um, Richard Hughes, was also saying that um, one of the bombs dropped in Cox's pits and the other one dropped just in front of Kempton Barrett, so it's sort of either side of the river where they landed. Um, luckily they both dropped on soft ground and did do a lot of structural damage, apart from all the windows and the roofs, you know. Um, but he did say that uh, Mr. Moss, the baker in Honeyhill Road, saw this parachute coming down and he thought it was a German parachutist as well. So he rushes out to sort of arrest him and luckily they said he was so close to the explosion that it sort of went off over him and all he got out of it was a broken arm. But he could have been more than 20, 30 yards from it when it exploded. And of course, sort of fascinating for the, a lot of the kids, they were all excited, they weren't worried about the danger, a lot of kids were going over to see if they could see the Germans that had landed or, and they picked up bits of parachutes and bits of the cord, um, bits of shrapnel even, as little souvenirs of when the bomb landed in Cox's pits. Um, there's another sort of effect, wasn't there, with your business, Jim? Yeah, right? well, I can't remember it myself, I wasn't that old, uh, four years old, but um, we had 12 horses um, opposite Moss's back uh, entrance next to the West End Club in, in the stables there and the following morning or that night when they went round there the stables had gone because they were made of corrugated iron and wood the horses had also gone and we had, uh, apparently my father and his brothers the following day went all over Bedford to find the horses they found all 12 and the furthest one had got to very near Great Barford <laughs> <laughs> they all bolted obviously yeah. you know, but uh, we found all 12 apparently. And the other thing was that um, you talk about parachutes, the following morning apparently, most of Queen's Park were going around looking for Germans <laughs> <laughs> so that they could claim a reward or something like that. But, uh, yeah, I've got another quote here, again, it's somebody else that lived in Coventry Road, and they're saying that lots of people are coming around and saying, Are your windows out? And they're all saying, Yeah, of course they are, you know, because the whole area. So you know, it landed in Cox's pits, you know. Right up to at least Coventry Road, possibly beyond, lost their windows, and any houses that were very close to it, and the roofs were blown off as well. So that person saying there was no structural damage was obviously not that close to what happened. Um, apparently, one person sort of reckoned that a lot of people found it quite amusing that the fact that all the um, the rubbish that was tipped in Cox's pits that night actually got returned to the houses it came from. In the first place. So, once again, Queen's Park's ahead of the rest of the world in recycling rubbish. Yeah. Um, but again, Morris, I think, has got a theory about the, um, the bombs. So, so, yeah, a couple of technical things I'll tell you about. It, that particular night, 14th of uh, November, was actually the night of the raid on Coventry. Yeah. Um, the, it was almost certain that the, uh, the bombs were, weren't, were intended for Coventry rather than, uh, rather than for Bedford. And they were almost certainly jettisoned at some point on the way there. Judging by the time, it was about half seven, eight o'clock in the evening. And uh, the raid on Coventry started about seven, between seven and eight o'clock. Um, the, there's a bit of a conspiracy theory about the raid on Coventry because the, um, at that point, uh, the Brit British uh, sort of intelligence, the uh, uh, breaking of codes and things like that have actually given the British intelligence a, a good clue as to why possibly that they knew that there was going to be a big raid that night, 
And it, it, there's been a bit of a conspiracy theory saying that they actually, the people at the very top actually knew that it was going to be Coventry, but they didn't want to intercept um, the bombers on the way there because they didn't want the Germans to know that we knew all about their secret uh, beam that they were using to target Coventry. And the, about the actual bombs themselves, they were, they were the only two what were called um, aerial mines, <coughs> the parachute mines, that were dropped on the whole of Africa <coughs> during the war. And they were actually designed, they were actually used uh, quite extensively in the raid on Coventry, and they were designed to uh, have a, an earthquake effect on hard, if they hit hard ground like streets, and they would, they would disrupt all the water supply. And the idea when they were doing this raid on Coventry was, which has caused devastating effects in the centre of Coventry, the very first planes were actually a mixture of incendiary devices and these parachute mines, which were designed, the incendiary devices would set fire to everything. The, uh, the earthquake type bombs for the parachute mines were designed to disrupt the water supply, they'd land and crack all the water mains so there was no water to put out the fires. Um, the other thing about the, uh, these, these bombs were very, very large. They were some of the largest bombs that the Germans had. And the fact that there was only a one, that they had some which they could only actually fit one per plane. Now, obviously, the fact that this was a, uh, a lone raider, they must have had <coughs> two on one single, so there would have been medium sized ones. But they were comparatively massive. They were um, uh, modified nor, uh, naval mines, not the sort of things you would see that were sort of round with spikes sticking out, but they were sort of torpedo shaped things. But they actually contained a very large amount of high explosive, which is why uh, they could actually, they were designed to do a, an awful lot of blast damage and also damage to the soil to disrupt uh, uh, things that say like water, water mains. The fact that both of them landed in um, relatively soggy ground, or relatively soft ground, meant that they probably did far less damage than they would have done had they landed on the street. Uh, mm -hmm. So in, their, in many ways, Bedford was actually, uh, and Queen's Park was very lucky with that. Yeah, I did notice at the bottom it says, considerable damage was done to a working men's club in the town district. Most seriously affected so was yes, the West End Club Tin Hut. <laughs> it didn't take that much to knock it down. Um, <laughs> a good number of people in the club at the time, and although they had an alarming alarming experience, there were reports of only minor injuries. And talking about that, obviously a few people got sort of cut with glass and bits of rubble falling off the roofs. But there was actually one death. It was um, the lady that um, lived in the gatehouse of Kempston Park, which was near the other explosion across the river. And apparently she was found dead under the bed and died of shock, but possibly a day or two later, not actually on the night. So there was actually one casualty, but I don't think it mentions in that report, does it? All right, can I just say that it's not going to be all doom and gloom tonight. There's going to be some lighter moments on this, you know. We've only got one more, lots of bombs to come, possibly emerge in the second half. But apart from that, you know, we're trying to sort of uh, make it quite cheery. So some of the ways that we use in adverts to actually sort of settle your nerves, you can't have Guinness, or if you're not old, for, old enough for Guinness, get your big spearmint gum and chew that, because it's quite... Quite your nerves and soothe your throat and keeps you mentally alert as well. So I think we need some of that tonight, as you know. All right, so that's a couple of ways, obviously, a good old British way of um, any sort of disasters that go on, to have a nice cup of tea with a big smiley face on your teapot and consumers sort of cashing in there, sort of kind of people. They've still got supplies. And then the other way is obviously a nice cup of bowl tea, it's good for women, children, and men. And yeah, restores your nerves, builds up strong nerves, and it helps, it helps, helps you sleep. sleep as well. Yeah, and obviously, if the bomb drops, you just sleep straight through it if you had a thing. <laughs> right, so we're now going to go on to uh, some other morale boosting things and just have a look at um, some of the things that were on at the Royal County Theatre just over the, the bridge and the Oval Teenies, the famous radio act, <laughs> sort of very subtle advertising their, their product actually appeared. That the Royal County Theatre. These were all from the very early 1940s, 4041. Um, that's at Hooters down the bottom. I take it's not the Hooters restaurant. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no. I looked at that and I thought, well, there's nobody interesting on that. But if you look at really small writing and this youth takes a bow 
uh, BBC show as Morecambe and Ernie Wise oh. really spot letters. So they would have been sort of just young lads at the time, yeah. learning very low down the bill. But um, that's when they started. It looks like they've actually set for acts there as well. Yeah. 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 There's been a lot on the telly about sort of uh, telling them about their, their early days, how they got together. We'll see, obviously, Carlisle, I don't think anybody's heard of her. Right, um, he was interested on this or that. The personal appearance of Jane from the Daily Mirror, this famous, famous cartoon. And apparently she um, did at, at times go for a little um, bit of um, swimming in the river at some point. That's all I'm going to say about that. Allegedly <laughs> <laughs> she was spotted in the river. It was just 1940. 40-ish, yeah, yeah, 1941. Well, I reckon I saw her again in 1956. <laughs> 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 again, you look at the other acts and nobody there that sort of uh, springs to mind. Right, famous Dorothy Squires, again, not, not quite good the bill there. Um, she went on to marry Roger Moore and sort of yeah, carried on their sort of separate careers that way. And we start looking at the others and yeah, she's just the one, the famous star from that advert. Uh, we did promise last time that we'd mentioned Phyllis Dixie, because um, got a little bit of a reaction. She actually appeared uh, at the County Theatre quite a few times, England's most beautiful and fascinating star, the girl Lord Champion Band. But these are all later on in the 1950s. No, even no, in the 40s, 40s, early 40s. early 40s. Yeah. Phyllis Dixie and her husband Jack Tracy stayed at our house. Yeah. We used oh, to really? put up theatricals. Oh, right. And so did um, Jane of the. Yeah. What paper was it? Uh, the Miller. Yeah. 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 So a lot of these people actually used to. We put them up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but what you don't realise is that they yeah. appeared in the 40s and they appeared in the 50s. Yeah, exactly. As I said earlier, yeah. I was a, a 16, 17 when I saw them for yeah. the first time. So this was the second time around. Yeah. Most of them stayed in Queen's Park because they used to come over the bridge straight down the theatre. That's right. Yeah. The Ford End Road was renowned for theatricals. Oh, oh, oh. Jim Holes of this world used to be there chasing the chorus girls. <laughs> 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 Jim Holes of this world. Not really. Right, I'm just going to show a quick cut of photos of Phyllis Dixie. All I can say about Phyllis Dixie was she carried too many feathers. <laughs> And this probably was a little bit later in her career, wasn't it? Yeah. There's a sort of photograph of her when yeah. she was appearing during the war. And just to prove that it wasn't just a one-off appearance, she did come back again. It was only seven when these pictures were, were up. So I walked around the stage door then. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting that the amount of shows that were on as well, you know, so 2.30 or 6.30 and then 8.45. I know there was someone that said that um, they had a job at the theatre, one of their jobs was to um, collect any programmes that are left after the matinee performance, iron them, and sell them again for the next performance. And he's nodded as well, so it was true. Yeah. Uh, just to prove it wasn't all glamour, there's um, the original crazy gangsters, Hilda Baker, there's another sort of thing that we've picked out. And these are just a selection, there's quite a lot of others, but these are the sort of more famous names that appeared just in those couple of years in the early 1940s. Um, there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, one of the reasons we sort of um, highlight the county theatre is that obviously the target of the next bomb was July 23rd, 1942, um, when there's a morning air raid. It's about sort of quarter to nine in the morning. People are going to work or going to school. And again, sort of a, a couple of bombs dropped, one of which hit. Just the, the bit just to the side of the County Theatre. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that gives you sort of like some idea of the damage. It's amazing that it just seemed to take out that one little building. Apparently, there was a sweet shop there, um, steel sweet shop, um, and that sort of suffered more damage. And obviously, there were no shows then on at the County Theatre for only a few months because it's amazing how quickly they actually um, got rid of all this rubble. And I'll just show you a few more photographs of the damage. Right, that's on the morning of it, so obviously people get a bit disrupted going to work or school. Um, you can see, if you look closely, all the little lumps of brickwork and masonry and stuff scattered all over the road at the bottom of the bridge. 
and there's one, there seemed to be only one person in charge there, sort of uh, keeping the crowds back. And that's a view of Theban Street, because the other bomb actually dropped sort of behind Theban Street and the sort of goods yard. Well, the two, two ones dropped down there, and caused quite a lot of damage, mainly to the, um, the street rather than the actual sort of uh, railway lines. So again, you can see a bit of a close-up of all the, the rubber that was flying around, and people just mucking through it and carrying on with their everyday life. Right, that's more of a close-up of um, what happened to um, the Hill Street Shop. Um, when we were reading the report, it said that there was actually no casualties, but then when I talked to John Benson the other day, he said there was actually one casualty. It was the canary that um, they had in the sweet shop <laughs> and killed over and died in the sort of shock that I meant to say. <laughs> Crushed under the rubble. Luckily, the sweet shop wasn't open at the time, but the canary um, got the full blast of it. And I'd say straight away there were people out there sort of getting rid of all the sort of the, the rubble. And within a few hours, in fact, most of it was sort of like cleared out. Right, so there's another <coughs> bomb dropped. <coughs> On that same corner, so this is Ashburnham Road, and it took out sort of half of the Grosvenor Hotel. And to this day, there's actually still a gap there, isn't there? Where there's a lot of little, um, yeah, there's a pad building, yeah. That's it, it's the uh, spiritualist church, it's just in that sort of gap. But it was a youth club at one point, yes, yeah. So they never did rebuild the other half of that hotel, and apparently, quite a lot of people that were performing at um the theatre that day, some, some of them actually stayed in that hotel at the time. Um, again, apart from the Canary, there were no casualties, there's only about sort of 14 people injured, and one of those was one of the rescuers that went up a ladder and fell off and twisted his ankle, so they were all sort of very minor injuries. One car got damaged as well, wasn't there, in the report, because Morris is meant to find the, um, is it the ALP? Yeah. Do you want to sort of pick out some bits from that? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, basically, uh, this, this is the official report that uh, the ARP wardens uh, produce for the county council. So it gives uh, quite a detailed theory about what actually happened. It uh, gives you the date. Um, it was 8.47 on the 23rd of July, 9.42. One enemy aircraft flying south to north dropped four high explosive bombs. Um, two, and it gives you the four places where they landed, two of them south of the bridge in, on uh, railway property, one just north of the bridge on the Grafton Assembly Rooms, and one a bit north of that on the Grosvenor Hotel. Um, and they said in addition to that there's approximately 250 dwelling houses and property slightly damaged by the blast and fragments. Um, one car Eight horsepower Ford car suffered some damage from blast and suction effects. Um, casualties mostly caused by the number four bomb, the last one, the one that was on the Grosvenor Hotel, was 14, 13 of these were civilians, and one was a member of the rescue party who slipped off an ladder and damaged his ankle. Um, morale, this is, this is one side, that's the, the other side of the, of the uh, moral, morale of the public was excellent and there was no panic. Um, they used the, um, as a centre, they used the, um, the seed merchants on the corner, the uh, Cooper, Cooper Seeds, as, as, as a uh, sort of a, a command post for organising the clear up and uh, any, any rescue. But by the looks of it, there wasn't much in the way of any rescue needed to be done, it was just the clearing up uh, afterwards. Yeah, we weren't sure what happened to the plane, but we've had sort of one, one quote from somebody on one of these BBC websites, and they reckon that the plane that dropped those bombs was actually shot down over Cambridgeshire somewhere. On the way back. Yeah, on the way back to Germany. So, uh, well, you know, it's unsubstantiated. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone remember either of those two bombs? Uh, yeah, on the way to school. Yeah. Yeah. Any other stories about them? <laughs> Right, that's the last bit of doom and gloom for the first half. Um, so, like I say, it took a few months before the Royal County Theatre got up and running. And it seemed like they'd, I don't know if they'd lost a lot of money in that time because they didn't seem to have so many quite big stars, but they did have Frank Formby, brother of the famous George Formby. So, I don't know if he was any good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a famous star, but he you know, couldn't play the ukulele. Right, you know. 
and there's some interesting little uh, acts going on there as well. Right, not to be outdone, um, this is a tiny little ad that I blew up to on the first side. I thought, oh, Victor Sylvester was on in Queen's Park. And when you look at it closely, it's something you dance into the recorded music of Victor Sylvester. So, my well, say, it's a bloke with a gramophone. Play, play the record. You know, so again, you know, Queen's Park invented the disco. We were there first with that as well. Make this Queen's Park's regular Monday boot. Where was the code part of the um, that's actually yeah. sort of part of the Gasworks, so it's like the Gasworks Social Club. What's the uh, Lawrence Street? Yeah. We're going to be talking about that in the second half yeah. as well, some of the uh, big name performers, not the sort of bloke with the records of somebody famous. But Victor Sylvester himself did actually appear at the County Theatre a few times, which is why he got popular and, you know, obviously this place is cashing in on sort of like just get some records and play them and people will come along and dance, again, to lift the morale off because we just had a couple of bombs and you know, people's spirits needed lifting. Alright, if that wasn't bad enough, oh, <coughs> before we got to the rationing, um, another thing that to encourage housewives to sort of uh, get involved, um, you could actually sell your surplus fruit to Bedford's Jam Centre, which is at the Gas, Cam uh, gas Corporation showrooms on Ford End Road. Um, you get really good price for gooseberries, it's threepence farthing per pound of gooseberries. <laughs> you know, gooseberries are quite light, so you're talking about quite a big bag of gooseberries being threepence farthing. And they'd start having competitions um, for sort of fruit bottling and preserving sort of pickles and chutney and, and all sorts. Apparently they had well over 500 entries for that competition. And it's all very much aimed at women, you know, it's like... Four fives of ten shillings each for clever housewives. You know, I'm not sure blokes were allowed to enter at all. You know, they probably just did the growing and the, the dig, digging the tomatoes up, and then it's over to the housewife with a nicely made up hair and face to sort of boil the jam up. Right, so on the subject of food now, and obviously ration books started coming in. This is 1942. Um, yeah. And at that point, again, it's the Bedford Gas Council, uh, Corporation showroom in Ford End Road was the centre where you actually get, had to go to get your, um, your new ration books. Mm -hmm. Apparently later on, was it a couple of the years Wesley later, Hall. it was then Wesley Hall was the centre where the, you picked up your ration books. And again, you get the sort of local firms cashing in because consumers seem to be really going to town with their adverts. Every sort of week there's a big quarter page advert if you register with us for cheese. <laughs> And eggs. Oh, that's on. That's on. Well, I don't know who did they sort of uh, the design of the adverts, but actually sort of really nice drawings and uh, designs, I think. <coughs> so again, you know, they were sort of trying to sort of uh, corner the market, so you know they they weren't just selling one sort of product like the sort of the meat. They were trying to sort of cover everything. So once people had gone there, they'd sort of. Just use all the ration book in, in one go. Jim, is that where Father Peter worked? Who? Yes, that's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, this is our last one actually for the first half, so we're not too concerned, it's a bit good. Um, and again, it's sort of praising up the uh, things like the Merchant Navy for getting these supplies um, coming in, and despite all the, the war that's going on, they still actually managed to get the food over to. Uh, country, you know, out to, out to the shops. And again, it's a really nice sort of piece of design. You know, someone was obviously <laughs> really on, on the ball with that. So these adverts really stood out amongst all the other ones that were just like text. Is there anybody with any memories of uh, shopping in Queen's Park during the war? Yeah. Going with their mums? Yeah. Where yeah. consumers? Yeah. We always went to Mosses, and Mosses made marvellous slab cakes next to the country. And we always went to Dawson's. I was yellow. 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 I was that's right, yeah. 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 Wasn't that one of the few things that wasn't rationed, apparently? You know, yeah. 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 yeah, it's like you would add as many fish and chips as you can, you know, bear the cues. I mean, there was uh, Saturday mornings, there was Dave Walls in Ford End Road and Brisbane's in Isersley, and you went to look at which was the longest queue. Yeah. And then you drew, <laughs> then you drew, then you drew 
usual the shortest one. And, and you, I used to go with a bag and a note written out by my mum, you know, what we wanted. And I used to draw whichever cue uh, was the shortest. But, uh, we used to come out on cups. You had to come out there, there was a dog left for you. Pardon? It was a dog, you'd come out there with the cue, was any left? Well, um, we seemed to get something, I don't think there was any time we'd run out, I don't know. Yes. But we always used to ask for scrap things as well. Chocolates <laughs> 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 and chips with scrap things. <laughs> Right, I know some of you came to the last um, event, it wasn't so much a talk as a, a quiz and then a sort of memory thing about the war with some sort of objects from the museum. But as part of that we showed um, a whole sort of reel, about 15 minutes of adverts, some of which we've already sort of shown tonight. But if anyone wants to get their tea and come in, we're going to sort of put that on again and that's just going to play over and over during the end of the lesson. Quite funny ones, isn't there? Some yeah. little pics of Hitler dresses a rat and uh, oh. so I wash a little soap bubble with Hitler on out of her hair and, and so on. So we've tried to go for some of the more quirky adverts and that's like a sort of 15 minute loop that we'll sort of just play. We'll play that and if there's anyone who wants to particularly look at any, any particular one we'll stop it and uh, so you can actually see the adverts. We've also got adverts for houses in the, uh, uh, they, were quite, uh, they were done quite early on in 1940. There's obviously after after a while there, there was no nobody actually going to be thinking about actually buying houses. But in 1940 there was lots of adverts for the houses in Queen's Park. Some of them are quite fascinating, especially the prices, roughly about five or six hundred pounds. Right, this is something. Yeah, we're going to start the second half with it. I'm not going to comment too much. Tell by the reaction, it's all right. Uh, but a few people have actually said to us. Nobody's ever mentioned the murder of the Luddingtons because it happened in the 40s and it's had quite an impact on the area. We thought it's something that does need to be sort of mentioned. Um, so it actually happened on 5th of July 1942. It's quite a small family in um, Iversley Road, and that's the view of the house how it looks now, sort of hidden behind that hedge. And um, the father was Arthur Morley Luddington and his wife Hilda, and they had a 26 year old son called Kenneth Arthur Luddington. Um, and apparently, I suppose what they'd be called today, um, some sort of schizophrenia that the father had, um. possibly paranoid schizophrenia, because he'd had what, um, what they kept calling brain storms, and he'd sort of be flinging his arms around and uh, shouting and swearing and, you know, sort of practically attacking other people in the family, the, the mother and the, uh, the son, and it was made a bit worse by the fact that he was going out drinking and coming back and having these sort of little fits and apparently on the day that um, the murder actually took place he'd come back from the allotment and they'd had a bit of a row and um, in the end the father said to the two of them said right why don't you just clear out both of you just clear out and the son said we're not clearing out we're so used to these storms why don't you just turn it down and let's live peacefully and they both went off and um, actually sort of both went off and did a little pub crawl in separate pubs around the town centre and then when uh, the father came back uh, the son had just had enough of all these sort of fits and uh, you know sort of a really sort of unsettled household and he actually because he was in the home guard he had a, a rifle and he ended up sort of like bashing his father to death basically with the rifle and there's a, a cutthroat razor involved as well and apparently the, the carnage that it created was so great that um, Harry Manton, that worked for Ambridge's as a slaughterhouseman, was the only person that could go in and actually clear up all the sort of resulting mess. <coughs> yeah, so the, apparently they were all sort of very calm afterwards, you know, he sort of stood there and admitted to the police when he turned up that he did it and he just had enough and, you know, and he was also like really, really sort of calm about it, having sort of just flipped. And they weren't sure actually if the son had some sort of um, schizophrenia as well, and it's maybe a sort of a genetic thing. And the trial, as you can see at the bottom, he was found um, guilty, but insane, and he was um, ordered to sort of um, be sentenced at His Majesty's pleasure, so they didn't put a, a life on it. And apparently he was out within sort of like 20 or something years. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the 60s, as kids, we were always told by mum, don't go around that bit, and, and stay, away from that, stay away from that man. So it was that just one sort of like, bit where it's just like... same walking his dog. That's it, yeah. But it's just that one incident, he just had so much of this sort of um, disruptive childhood and he just like sort of just went mad and ended up sort of beating his father to death.
Anybody yeah. remember it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Well, not good. <laughs> and I say it's something we wanted to bring it to attention because you know it was a, a big event in the, in the area, like I said, the Queen's Park tragedy. Yeah. And hopefully now we can move on to sort of yeah. sort of brighter things. Us people in the Honey Hill Road area, we always thought Italy Road was a bit dodgy. <laughs> before but it's again you know, somebody mentioned the Copart and Sword earlier on. Well this was Copart and Sword and the only if you've seen the, 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 the larger photograph we know it's Copart and Sword yeah. by, by the woodwork there on the sort of balcony at the front. But uh, obviously you know Bing Crosby and, and Glenn Miller. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any stories uh, about Glenn Miller because I mean of all the famous people that sort of came to Queen's Park mm -hmm. he must be one of the most famous. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think this was, uh, I think we're getting to about 1944 now, I mean, 43, 44, yeah. which brings my age up uh, a little bit. But I can remember um, Bedford Town Football Ground ceased to operate as a, a football ground during the war, and it became a haven for us old boys to play in because the grass was about four foot high and it was all ramshackled. And, uh, <coughs> uh, so we used to go in into the the ground and do whatever we've got to do uh, uh, as young boys, bows and arrows, I suppose, and things like that. But one particular day, we, I think there were three of us, uh, Tony Emmett, Barry Hollis and myself, and we heard this music and noise coming from over the wall, and I don't know if you can remember, but all around the gas works, and still is to a certain degree, there's a, a, a granite type wall, yeah. which is about nearly three foot wide, I would imagine. And I can remember still to this day climbing up this wall and laying on the top and seeing these uh, people playing uh, instruments, lazing around in deck chairs, one or two playing tennis, not knowing who they were and, until many, many years later. But that's my recollection of uh, uh, Co Partners Hall. And somebody mentioned why, why was it Co Partners Hall? Well, um, the reason why, was that um, everybody was employed um, uh, at the gas works. Uh, had a chance to, I suppose you'd call them shares, yeah. and you invested, I think, so much money, and, and then you became a co-partner. Obviously, co-partners hall was named after that. And it was a place where anybody who was employed at the gas work used it for anything. In fact, they had a, a very, very good dramatic society in the uh, gas works, so we used to put on plays in the co-partners hall, and weddings and dances, and. Uh, anything what happened in Queen's Park usually went to co Butler's Hall and I'm sure you can remember probably going down for some reason or other. Um, the other story that I tell uh, again at co, co Butler's Hall is uh, the, the unique piece of information we gleaned out of Jean Walls uh, uh, before she died was uh, uh, paper cuttings from the best times of uh, uh, Bing Crosby going into Dave Wall's fish shop for one of fish and two of chips and <laughs> then me the sending somebody down there for some fish and chips, you know. Things that probably would never happen anywhere else in the world, but it just happened in Queen's Park uh, in Dave Wall's fish shop. I mean, I uh, don't know whether I had fish and chips in America in those days, it's probably that's where it came from in the first place. But, but that's my recollection of... Uh, uh, co Partners Hall, um, quite a th thriving th th place near the wall, and for many years after the war, and uh, so I think it went in defunct in probably what the 80s? Yeah. When the Eagles folded. Um. Okay, so we've now got up to 1945 VE Day. Um, this is a cut in from the uh, Bedfordshire Times, uh, first one after, after VE Day. Uh, very first, uh, just a, a list of a few things that went on actually on that, that day and that night. Um, very first four things are all Queen's Park. The, the stuffed dummy of Hitler, complete with a knife in his back, was hung by some schoolboys on a lamppost in Coventry Road, Queen's Park. His, his dummy was later burnt on a grand midnight bonfire. Morrison Shelter, decorated with bunting on Alan Close. A kindly lady of Hurst Grove giving out sweets to children in the street. 
picture of that coming up, or something to do with that coming up. Uh, couples dancing outside the illuminated West End Club at Queen's Sparks on late at night. Uh, a Mrs. D. Holden at Ford End Road produced a copy of the London Evening newspaper from the day the First World War finished. <laughs> was um, showing them around to people, a few other <coughs> interesting things, that people party marching down the middle of the road on V night wearing dustbin lids on their heads. <laughs> uh, uh, sure, no, I do believe couples dancing out, dance outside the Western Club should be the bell. Outside the bell, possibly. Uh, because um, I have got a photograph of uh, V night when the Damon boys played on the balcony of the bell and everybody in Queen's Park danced and congregated around where the the oak trees now mm -hmm. uh, and the roundabout. I don't know if anybody can remember that. No. Coming out and, and dancing late night. Yeah. Yeah. There's also things like planes flying low overhead, um, uh, fire talking flares and uh, making sat signaling V in Morse with the navigation <coughs> lights as well <coughs> over the town. Yeah. But so obviously there's a big celebration that, yeah. that, that night. One other thing on the bottom left hand corner, Mr. Joe Fitzpatrick. Yeah ice cream vendor, well I'm saying no more, but he'll turn up in Atlanta uh, uh, in the 50s, in the, the 50s next meeting, yes. with, because he, he owned a uh, lino uh, down there at Honey Hill Lino, but anyway I can't say no more, but well, that's uh, <laughs> not before. Yeah. Okay, so there we have her smoke. Oh, and yeah. probably, possibly, the person who was giving out <coughs> sweets, with a little, with a table out in the middle. Um, as you can see down the bottom, you can see the gasometer and the coking plant at the bottom. Um, so, and this is the where um, the Allen Club is there. So this is sort of the, the other side of the street, and a little bit of bunting out and a few flags. And this is pointing in the other direction, <coughs> from roughly where the first photograph was taken of a. A three-legged race, but not a particularly competitive one. There's only two of them. Yeah, one of them appears to be carrying the other, carrying the smaller child. And this gets cheap into the two. And then we've got the um, Honey Hill Road celebration. This is Honey Hill Road. The, the sort of the this gap at the bottom would be where the bell, the roundabout, the bell is up <coughs> You've got mosses on the right. I've got mosses on the right. You can just see where the end of that, where the end of that house is. You can see where the mosses is. Yeah. And if you see from the right, it's on the picture from higher up. Slightly different direction. Yeah, we have got a better photograph of that. This is the only one I can find at the time. Who's the old shoe ladies on the right hand side? Next door to Mosses. The girl in the centre on somebody's shoulders, that's Beryl Salisbury, I do know that. That's me on the right. And then you on the right. Do, do you know when, when exactly it was? I don't think it's actually VE Day or something. It must have been something that was organised after VE Day. I don't remember. <laughs> Were you there, Carol? Yeah, yeah. I'm behind all. Oh, yeah. Sometimes some sort of between June and August uh, 1945. Yeah. And right, it's, yeah, it's months since we mentioned the football. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the next talk. You've got a big idea of football is going to be in the next talk about 50s. Um, but obviously during the war there wasn't any football at the Eagles ground. There's even rumours that um, and they sort of used it for sort of uh, some sort of military use for a while. And like Jim said, the grass was right up here. I think they actually at one point had a donkey or a horse in there to try and keep the grass down. But it became a playground for all the local kids. You know, you could get in underneath the stand and that as a den. Um, I've heard stories that people actually sort of climbed on the roof and actually broke the head off the eagle as they're mucking about on the roof of the main stand. Um, finding loads of chocolates that were about six years out of date, but still eating them. Um, you know, so lots were going on. I, I find it uh, very interesting because Saturday, August 25th, 1945, the first match uh, after the war, and, and I've just been speaking about grass being four foot high and the, the, the ground being in disrepair, and somebody, because there wasn't any real committee or groundsman or anything like that, but somebody got that ground 
to the seven league standard uh, virtually within a few months. Yeah. Uh, and that man there, which uh, uh, Paul will tell you about, uh, I can remember going down there as a, as a nine year old, uh, mad on football uh, with three or four others, and he had played for England not that far uh, previous, but uh, he encouraged us old boys to play football. He didn't kick us out or, you know, uh, tell us to clear off. He, uh, he he gave us a football and said, do this and do that. And, and while he was saying that, 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 he was marking trained. the pitch out. So, a remarkable man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, well, I'd say you could actually enter the Southern League at that point, which is uh, quite a big level up from where we played before the war. Um, it's a bit of a strange season because um, nobody actually played a full amount of games because um, some teams were low on numbers because they're obviously a lot of the players were still on military service and um, games got cancelled because they couldn't travel or they couldn't afford to travel to the matches. So they had to sort of make up the, um, the points at the end and sort of try and balance all the points out. So it's a bit of a strange season. Um, and said that, the, uh, the new manager has actually called it Alf Strange. <laughs> um, and again, like Jim was saying, it's quite a coup to actually get him as the manager of the Eagles. Because in the early 1930s, he'd actually played for Sheffield Wednesday when they won the first division. This is like, what's the premiership now? Um, won it two seasons on the trot with him on the star players. Um, he went on to play for England 20 times. At two of those games, he actually captained England. So it's a bit like, you know, getting the sort of former captain of England coming along and sort of getting the job as manager mm -hmm. of your local team straight after the war. And the other thing I did find out the other day, there's a couple of times when Alf Strange was playing for England, and they played at Hampden Park. And of course, there's no safety regulations in those days. So the first one when they played, was actually April the 1st, no, no, sorry, it's March the 28th, 1931, and it's a world record attendance for a football match, 129,000. 810, so it's the population of Bedford as it's now, all in Hampton Park watching the match. But not only that, two years later, and it wasn't April 1st, 1933, um, they broke the world record again for the biggest ever attendance, and that was 136,259. You know, so there's this man sort of turns up at Eagles, sort of put in front of a few thousand crowds, and actually sort of played for his national country in front of over 130,000 people. Um, only sort of like 10, 15 years previously. Um, I think he only sort of stayed for a couple of seasons, then sort of uh, moved on. So he was actually commuting from Derby or Derbyshire to sort of run the team and then come down and uh, say he helped Mark out the pitch. So he wasn't just manager, he was the groundsman and uh, I think he possibly even played a few times when they were very short. <coughs> but apparently in those days they couldn't always get a full team so they'd have, have an announcement over the loudspeakers, has anyone got any boots? Can they <laughs> can have a game, you know? And um, a few people ended up playing sort of quite a few times with Bedford, you know, just simply because they were there and there was a couple of players short because they couldn't get them on the train or whatever. Yeah, so the football was sort of... Uh, Back in tow, during the war there were quite a lot of matches at Allen Park and quite often it was like a local works 11 or something against an army 11. But obviously the army team was sort of made up of quite a lot of um, international players, players from Arsenal and Newcastle and all sorts. And, you know, so football was still going on during the war but not actually at the Erie, the Eagles ground. Of course, as you notice, that's the war had only just finished. Um, if you're in uniform, mm. you got in half price. Mm. <laughs> six, uh, pence, six pence instead of a shilling. <laughs> So there was, the teams were quite well spread out, you know, you've got things like Cardiff and Hereford and Barrytown. Um, you know, that's why, you know, they just couldn't afford to travel all these distances um, just to sort of play a match. So the season was a bit sort of curtailed in the end. Right, next thing happened in 1946. So 1946, so yeah, Valentine's Day, 1946. Um, it's uh, quite a uh, good for as it's this year, it's the Diamond Jubilee, there's uh, Princess Elizabeth uh, visited Bedford, um, arrived at the, had a reception at the town hall, and she was, um, there was various things that she wanted to do and wanted to see, and one of the things was that she wanted to um, see as many, uh, allow as many school children as possible to see her. So they actually had, uh, from the town hall, a little trip round in a circular trip round Bedford and ended up at the Swan Hotel taking in as many um, schools as possible so that uh, their school children could uh, see her. And the other thing that they were doing is uh, a, a parade of the Land Army and other, and other sort of civilian uh, volunteers during the war so that they, uh, they had a march past by uh, uh, on the market squares and that. 
Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as I say, uh, left the town hall um, after conversation with the mayor. Uh, went down Midland Road, uh, before down Road Bridge, and received a, a special welcome as a car slowly passed crowds of children and adults outside the Queen's Park schools. The uh, you know, Fordham Road, Marble Road, up to Winfield Road, Hurst Road, Brom Road, and they, they went past the high school, Bedford School, and schools on uh, Golden Road as well, before ending up at um, to the Swan. Yeah, apparently it's Princess Elizabeth's wish that um, she did that, because yes. you know, from the town hall to the Swan Hotel, I mean, you can walk that in what, two minutes, yeah. um, but she really wanted to make sure people as possible to see that. Uh, yeah. And particularly school children or younger people, uh, that could actually um, get a chance to, to see her. Excuse me, do you know that when she came into the town, she actually came down Cardington Road past the Daymaris School? Oh, right, yes. Because I was at the Daymaris You were at the Daymaris, yes. Um, um, from, from yeah. well, I've, I've and I was in the front row waving my little flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we went down the London Road as well. That's it. Yes. We went down London Road until so we went past <laughs> the yeah. Jubilee and then down uh, past mm. um, uh, Dame Alice on the way into town. Uh, now, one year after VE Day, they had a, uh, a series of, sort of um, parties, street parties, various things going on, and this was at the Cape Park this fall. Um, fancy dress party for the children, so part of us all. Um, a number of people in very strange outfits. <laughs> There's one there that I don't think will be allowed today, but there you go. Top left hand corner. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, a, there's another photograph that was taken at, uh, so this is the entrance to, to Coke Park, this hall, so this is Lawrence Street, heading off in the distance. And we've got uh, another one, we've just got a list of some of the names there, so if any, I don't know if anyone recognises any of the names, the, the, the prize winners. Now, it's funny because we were looking at this the other day at Jim's house and I'd arranged to go and see John Benson because he lives just across the road and John Benson is actually the most original boy's costume. And it wasn't for a minstrel, it was a, he was actually just a pilot. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm not sure if it was actually Christmas 1947 or it was early 1948. And the other one was sometime early in the 40s, uh, during, actually during the war, where this, that was held at the West End Club. And it was, um, there was people from the Home Guard. No, <laughs> it was all about rationing earlier. Um, after the war, rationing got even worse, and some things that weren't rationed during the war, because the shortages, um, started to be rationed, and in particular, bread. Um, bread rationing in uh, sort of 1946. It seems, 21st of July 1946, a very complicated system of, um, of doing it. Uh, you had to work out what your BU was your bread unit, and you had a certain number of bread units, and depending on your age, or if you're working um, heavy duty jobs, um, you've got different amounts. Um, a normal, ad just looking at the thing for a normal adult, uh, buff book, page 39, G coupons, each large square is worth 24 bread units, the four smallest squares within the large square each worth six bread units. <laughs> and you could work out, you've got a large, small loaf for two bread units and a large one for four and two bread. So with one of your smaller squares, you get a large loaf and some scones, uh, that'd be your six bread units. But there's all sorts of other little bits, and this bit here, you can't see it very well, but workers on the job got more. As people are doing heavy manual work, um, got, a, got a larger, um, larger entitlement. But um, the, the whole thing just seems to be so confident that they put this in the paper one week, and then this one was put in the week after, because I think it's slightly simplified it, because I don't think, I think people looked at these charts and they probably couldn't work out what the hell is going on with it. Michelle Yashman would have worked it out. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Now we're going down to the river. Ignore this one uh, to begin with. We're looking at the winter of 47. Now, as you can imagine, you can all remember that. It's a pretty hard winter. That, that, so we've got limited amount of photographs with snow uh, around. But, uh, that was the bridge over to Foster's Island down the side. And, one of the things I can remember was that the river froze over and it was pretty thick and the challenge was walking from the Lido, which the Lido wasn't there, but from Foster's Island to the town bridge on the river. I don't know if anybody here did it, but many, many people did. I mean, my mother dared me to do it, but I still done it with other boys and we walked from there right the way down through the site, past here, right the way under the twin bridges down to town with other people. Um, can you remember anything about 47? 47, yeah. 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 Floods. I know, after the, we haven't come to the floods yet. <laughs> <laughs> anything with the snow or ice? That's right. Yeah. In yeah. the um, in the last hundred years, the two worst winters are forty-seven and sixty-two, and yeah. a little bit of the, <coughs> some areas were worse in forty-seven and sixty-two, and some were worse, some were worse the other way round. But uh, all in all, those two winters were the, the two yeah. harshest winters. So, uh, yes, yes, yeah. I mean, a lot of invest. <laughs> even, even, yeah, even the even the major roads like the A6 were, were blocked uh, yeah. uh, north of uh, Bledsoe and, and towards Luton. Um, the um, the use uh, 
German prisoners of war were often then uh, used to uh, dig, out, dig um, through to the villages that were cut off in North, in North Bedfordshire. Uh, a lot of them were actually being used in North Bedfordshire in the villages to, to uh, mend the roads and sort of uh, cut down hedges and stuff anyway. And um, during they, there, was a, there was quite a lot of complaining in the, in the local papers about the uh, German prisoners of war at that point because uh, they thought they were being treated, not treated harshly enough. Um, they were complaining that uh, because of fuel shortages at the same time that they were um, they were allowed to go on normal buses and not on the um, on the army wagons that would normally take them uh, to to where they were working. And uh, there was actually a letter in uh, in, the Bed in the Bedford Record uh, in sorry, late February or early March uh, 1947 saying that uh, the German prisoners of war were seen too cheerful and they were obviously being treated better than they deserved to be. But Jim was telling me I told the story about uh, on the field on yeah. um, well, Roman Road. Right. Yeah, my, my father during the war he farmed the uh, two field choppers at Beacon Turn on, on Roman Road. And uh, my memory is uh, in 46, 47, was every evening he, he got allocated four German prisoner of war uh, soldiers to help him get the harvest in. And uh, every night, my, I used to go with my father, and he used to take uh, bread and cheese and, and a keg of beer uh, to the German prisoner of war who was who were doing the work. And, and when I reflect back now, I think that our soldiers were still in Germany, in you know, uh, being treated pretty poorly. And mm. um, we we looked after the prisoner of war. So it's always stuck in my mind uh, that, that mm. we fed them. They worked hard. They had to work hard. But they worked a lot harder than the challenge, so don't yeah. uh, But uh, mm. they got the title of so what I said, you know, I can uh, verify. Yeah, I was talking to John Benton the other day, he was one of the people that actually walked, I think walked from um, Town Bridge right back to Queen's Park, yeah. because the school was cancelled that day, so he thought, I'll just walk from uh, where Britannia was, <coughs> all the way along in the middle of the river. Um, but he also gave me this really good story about they lived up uh, Comfy Road, he was only about yes. 10 or 11 at the time, and he saw the, they saw this sort of group of um, German prisoners at war coming down with their shovels. And of course, a couple of lads picked up a snowball and chucked it at these Germans, and this sort of snowball fight broke out between these young German prisoners of war. And they said they looked, they said, they looked sort of really, like you said, looked really cheerful, you know, because they actually sort of joined in for about five, ten minutes, and they're told, oh, come on, we've got this work now. But uh, I think the kids actually won in the end. <laughs> so they sort of chucking them as they, they went off to do yeah. what work they'd come to, just basically clear the road so the horses and carts could get through again, because it stopped think, every yeah. delivery. I think the other thing uh, that our children and grandchildren find it hard to uh, comprehend is the amount of snow that used to be on the roofs of the houses yeah. and then when it thawed out, right. when it slid off uh, and, and caused an avalanche. I mean, yeah. they don't see that now. And the other thing you used to get in those days were massive great icicles. Yeah. Uh, again, you very rarely see an icicle today. So, other things. But the following on then from the snow, I mean, I, I personally can only remember the good things about 47 and the snow. I can't remember about traffic and well, I wasn't bothered, but I can remember the honey hills um, sledging up there and yeah. virtually having a crest to run uh, <laughs> and the snow was that deep. And climbing and sliding right across yeah, the river. Yeah, you know, it's terrific. And then, of course, what happened then? We, we had the thaw. We had the thaw and then had the floods. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and um, if you go on to the next slide. Well, just to tell you what happened. Oh, yes. yes. And this is uh, nothing to do with the 40s. In fact, it's the 20s, but it's a, 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 the only ones we've got are the bathing shelters. But what I was going to say, when the thaw came and we really had the floods, I can remember, probably you can as well, you can hardly see the bathing shelters oh, no. because no. the level of the water no. came right across yeah. and it went right up at the back of the West End Club uh, where all the uh, allotments were. You remember all the allotments when George Carbox and uh, Old Ambition and they all had pigs and chickens and, and the whole of the, the chicken runs and the pig styles got washed away and the height of the river was that great that you could lean over the town bridge and touch the water yeah. in Bedford. And the story goes, I don't know whether George Tarbox went there and reckons he plucked his pigs out of the river. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the stories that you know, was told that uh, people were going down there. It, it couldn't get under the bridge. So all the uh, 
uh, chicken runs and huts and pigsties, and that was jammed up against the, the bridge, couldn't get under the bridge, so the mm -hmm. That's the story that they went down there. Uh, and of course, oh, the, the football ground was well underwater. Yeah, uh, uh, the Eagles ground was here. They, again, it's the only time in my lifetime, and, and most people, that water came into Fall End Road. Not much, but the Eagles ground, uh, the goalposts are eight foot high, and you could just about see that much of the goalposts, about 18 inches. So <coughs> what, there was a report in the paper in the middle of March 1947 saying that they were trying to get the ground ready for a match and they had five or six stirrup pumps and buckets. They were hoping to get a mechanical pump, but they were having to make do with stirrup pumps and buckets, which uh, I think was one hell of a job. <laughs> and the water was as high as that. We've got a couple more pictures down by the river. And again, the floods would have just like come up, straight across that bloke and his dog and the, uh, and the family. Yeah. Yeah. We've had those up before these photographs, they're, they're remarkable photographs because I probably told you when I spoke before about the site. Um, uh, Pauline and I, we look for photographs of the baby shelters for uh, or a good six or eight months. We went up the archives of the county hall and the, the library and we asked pretty much everybody, have you got photographs of the baby shelters or anything to do with the site? And nobody had until we walked. Uh, uh, we are a rambling group, and Pauline had to uh, uh, be walking with uh, Wendy Shadrach, which was, and uh, mentioned it to her, and she said, well, I've got two albums, so I know there's a lot of photographs in there, uh, going back to my, I think, father, uh, maybe not her father, she brought them to us, and lo and behold, there was about 22 photographs of the slide <coughs> and the baby shelters, and, and these are, I think that's her dad. Wendy Shadrach's dad, is it? I don't know. Len Shadrach, was it? No. He was in there. Yeah, he was in there. Yeah. 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 But anyway, that's a, a little story. Very deep, little there. Pardon? It's very deep there. Yes. That was empty foot, did it? Like, yeah. yeah. Probably yeah. more yeah. come up around the fifty. Yeah. 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 Two diving boards, yeah. one each end of the baby shelters. Yeah. And we so used to. All the girls and boys, we used to have this guy keep the kettle boiling. Do you remember it? Yeah. And you used to run in, jump or dive in, one dive in, swim there, get out and run and keep, keep it going. Uh, and you was never allowed to get out the other side. That was forbidden yeah. to get out on the Kempston yeah. side. Yeah. Don't know why, but uh, we weren't allowed. That was foreign country to us. You had to swim to get Yes, you had to swim then. Archie Stokes and Ed Cannon were the attendants there, full time attendants. <laughs> You used to have to show your swimming certificate before you were there. I think you, could, you had to swim at uh, 50 yards. Yeah, Archie yeah. Stokes used to be qualified to teach people to swim, and he used to uh, teach people along the bank, yeah. uh, just where the diving was. Right, we're going to, this is the, uh, there's still, there's two stones. One, this one is on um, the side of Freedom Street Bridge. <coughs> it's getting very, very warm now, mm -hmm. but, um, this is the flood level of the 15th of March, 947. There's actually two uh, ones further down from the, 19, from the 1920s, 1930s. And this one's on the town bridge, opposite the, uh, opposite the Swan Hotel, where the steps are that go down to where the boats used to uh, um, leave from. Um, this is the actual arch of the town bridge, and that's the uh, flood level. This is a close-up of it, March 1947. I took that, took that was, uh, a few days ago. Next one, um, J.P. Wright's. Um, they were involved in all sorts of things. Uh, they were making uh, wood, uh, a lot of the sort of wooden stuff that they made, uh, structures for uh, <coughs> airplanes and things like that. Because a lot of the uh, lot of planes still had, uh, may have had a, an aluminium coating, but they were actually uh, wooden structures inside. But one of, the, one of the big things they did was to uh, make the, um, the altar for the Battle of Britain Memorial Chapel in Westminster Abbey. And this is from 1947. That's a, <coughs> the actual uh, memorial. And there's a photograph at the top of... Um, most of these people had actually worked... This is in the sort of mid-40s. Uh, most of the people actually worked there for about 40 to 50 years. I don't know if any of those names are, I'll put their names up by the side, if any of those are um, familiar to any of you? Walton. 
Yeah. Most of them were craftsmen, <laughs> master carpenters. Mm -hmm. Oh, Water, Jane Water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Walter's Would that be Sid Place I don't know. Yeah, you know the we'll on to the next one. Uh, 1948, uh, decided to improve the traffic at the bottom of um, Freeman Street Bridge by putting this very strange looking roundabout. Uh, nobody appeared to know exactly which way to go around it. Uh, and, uh, it looks a bit of a death trap, to be honest. It would have been. And then, a word about. Well, again, you know, it's all covered in the Queen because it's Diamond Jubilee this year. Also, it's obviously the, next, the last time the Olympics. The Olympics were held in London. Um, we had a very young Queen Spark contingent there, which is Malcolm Dalrymple on the right there, and his father, who trained him, mm -hmm. is his coach, um, Jock Dalrymple, who was in the 1924 and the 1928 Olympics. Um, both sort of, yeah, so they both flew in the Olympics for, for Great Britain, and that's quite a unique feat. Um, think about Malcolm, um, so I interviewed him a few times. He never actually sort of mentioned how he got on. I've actually had to look this up, and apparently he was the, he was the, um, the British record holder at the time. He won the three A's championship, which meant that he was the top thrower to represent us in the Olympics. And for his first throw, he put everything into his first throw, and it would have been enough to qualify for the final. But apparently he was just a few inches just over the board that he not had to sort of to go over. And what made it even more ironic was that the person that was the touch judge was actually um, a teacher at Bedford Modern School. So not just an English bloke, but someone from Bedford who actually ruled that that throw was sort of um, illegal. And that really threw him, big part of the pun. Um, and the next two throws, he didn't go anywhere near as much. He put everything, all his efforts into that first throw to try and qualify for the final and just missed out. You know, just by a few inches, it's put being over the line. Um, this is actually at uh, Golden Road. Uh, rugby ground, and I'm pretty certain that, well, it's definite that that photo is actually posed for the camera because there's no way you'd get a British record. You'd get more chance of actually stabbing himself with a javelin if you threw it at that angle. <laughs> he's, he's always been told to sort of tilt the, the javelin so the, the photographer can actually get it all in the shot, you know, because with his follow through, that would go straight up and straight down again. Yeah. Um, quite interesting that um, Alan's magazine didn't make all that much yeah, fuss about it. It was in Brown Road. Yes. Right, sure, yeah, that's it, yeah. We've got sort of stories in one of our previous magazines um, about the fact that you used to practice in the road, actually practice throwing the javelin down the road. I see John not in there, who's one of his neighbours. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, he's told eventually by, he worked at Allen's, he's told by the boss at Allen's that, you know, don't practice in the road anymore. You'll have uh, two hours off at lunchtime, you've got to Allen Park, you can practice there. And then apparently he said, but that two hours you'll make up afterwards. <laughs> you know, so they didn't actually make that big a thing, the fact that they actually got his name wrong in the Owens magazine. It should be MJW Dalrymple, not the end of Malcolm. They couldn't even get his name right there. But, you know, he thought they'd make a lot more fuss of that, you know, one of their workers is actually up there in the Olympics, you know, in your, in your home country. Um, but apparently it didn't stop him playing football because there's a, a football team photo in the same year where he was actually played on the wing for the um, Allen's Queen's Works football team as well, as well as being in training. But they used to get a lot of their food from, um, I think the Canadian Olympic Association spent, uh, sent a lot of food over because obviously the British athletes were still on rations, you know, so a lot of these other countries, Commonwealth countries helped out by sending jam and various other things. So obviously the jam centre had closed by now, I suppose, isn't it? I've now we've just got a, a few adverts, um, various things to help um, make do with what, you, what they've got rather than um, sort of use up uh, valuable resources. Uh, so get your, your rubber wellingtons repaired rather than buying a new mm -hmm. one. So you do patches and heels and soles. And you didn't have to use any coupons up if you had it repaired. So Williams on Ford End Road. Had, uh, Repair, expert repair of Wellingtons and of course um, silk and things were in very short supply but um, they started to cut up all the old parachutes. Um, 
If you like, buy a whole parachute or a half a parachute, or it looks like you could actually buy um, a panel of a parachute. Uh, it's about the ones that came down with the bombs, by the way. Friendly coals and bird bits, you know, these are yeah, English ones. Off those, you know, <laughs> yeah, these are yeah, so, English um, ones. You can either get the white silk or the cream or biscuit or yellow, and then there's the cotton, the cheaper ones, the cotton ones in orange and yellow, or in khaki. <laughs> and also, plastic, plastic started to be available, and that again wasn't it wasn't on, uh, on coupons. So, um, Raggins would make you a plastic uh, Mac. With all that. But they also would all make you curtains, um, curtains, raincoats. Handbags, swimming, swimsuits, collars, tablecloths, etc. Out of their sheets of plastic. I'm not quite sure about the plastic swimming swimsuits. A <laughs> uh, couple of local adverts. Uh, Odell's Garage. Um, they, they, they offering improved service, private and commercial petrol. <laughs> And um, the uh, Hurst Grove Radio Television selling, selling the latest uh, model flat screen television. <laughs> and and not, just after the war, a number of people who'd uh, were, were taught in uh, Queen's Park uh, Junior School for 40, 50, uh, 40 odd years retired. And this is, um, is it Captain, yeah. Captain, Captain Jones? Retired and um, yeah. getting his radio for yeah. 45 years of service. Yeah. Wonderful man. Mm. Mm. You remember me about five years later? Mm. The living down that now. <laughs> 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 I was barking down for him as a person. He was shouting, yeah. 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 hello, doors, and in the book of mine. That was July 1949, so we're coming quite close to the end. Um, a lot of pictures from Alan. We haven't really mentioned Alan so far, so I've got a few pictures from Alan's from uh, 1949. Um, the bit they call Suicide Corner, where all everyone came piling out on their bikes. And obviously, been a number of accidents there with people piling into each other. Um, so this one's from March 1949. Um, Come out and over the bridge. There's not many photographs uh, of Alan's men coming up. The bridge. There's a lot going down. There's the lots side. of pictures at the other side. Yeah, yeah. So they're all that's fine to yeah. go. And again, um, an outing to go to a, a pumping station where they put pumps in. It doesn't sound particularly exciting, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they don't look particularly happy with uh, Johnny Green to go, nice. go visit a uh, pumping station. But uh, again, there's this by uh, the entrance. Um, Not sure you're going to let him run in. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. This is October 1949, and there's also after a heavy rainfall in um, May 1949, um, the picture again of Suicide Corner, as they called it, um, the bus going through the, uh, the, the water line on the surface. And I've been all over the world. Yes, yes. All the public stations, all that I've been published. Yes. And the yeah, next one, uh, again, these are all Alan's ones uh, from 1948, 1949. Um, Alan's Club, behind the bar. Notice no, no pumps or anything like that. Straight out of the barrel for the beer. And uh, I think that must be posed for the... Uh, some strange bottles on the back as well. But, uh, and I take it the shield in the, on top of the barrels is probably <coughs> must be one of the sort of a darts cuff or something like that. Some, some one of the sort of trophies for um, something that they actually held in the club. Um, one at the top corner on the right hand side is uh, one of the children's parties, Christmas parties from 19, that's Christmas 1948. And the, um, there was a, an inter uh, department uh, sort of pub sports competition. This is a competition between uh, the, uh, the main works and the Bingham works. And that's the final of the uh, Skittles competition. And then uh, we've got Alan's Park again, again 1949. Um, some of the uh, people from the, uh, the 
doing the caretaking and uh, groundsman. And the very last one is Christmas 1949. Eight beds, Park. Eight, eight beds Queen's Park Wolf Club Pack. Um, uh, what's that club? Um, <laughs> getting their Nintendos or whatever they get those days from underneath the Christmas tree. Yeah, so that, that, was, that, that would have been just uh, sort of mid, just before Christmas 1949. So that brings us right up to the end of the 1940s. Um, the next talk is going to be on the 50s in um, two months' time. First, what, what date is May the 3rd. May the 3rd. <coughs> First Thursday in, in May. And uh, we've already got some, uh, got some quite interesting things uh, already lined up for that. Any questions? Any questions? questions? Mr. Gary Rimble became a policeman. Yes. That's right, yeah. Just died. Right. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.